Listener discretion is advised. True crime can be strangely fascinating. This true crime is odd, macabre, and haunted. I'm Diane, your guide into the shadows. Welcome to Phantasmal Crime. The historic Doheny Greystone Estate is more commonly known as the Greystone Mansion and was even once known as the Hearst Castle. This glorious and grand home was built in the future home of the Truesdale Estates overlooking Beverly Hills. The mansion has been the set for several movies, music videos, and television shows, but it was also the setting for a murder-suicide. The heir to one of the great financial empires, Edward Ned Doheny Jr., the man who owned the house, was dead. For decades, visitors and staff have claimed that paranormal experiences have occurred at the Greystone. Edward Lawrence Doheny bought the land that the Greystone Mansion would eventually be built upon. He had come to California from Wisconsin, where he was born. Doheny was dreaming of gold, but he found something better, black gold. Doheny and his friend Charles A. Canfield struck oil in Los Angeles in 1892. Their interests traveled further south to Mexico, and before long, the two men were the largest producers of oil in the world at that time. Doheny began building his financial empire. He had married Carrie Luella Wilkins in 1883, and they had two children, a daughter named Eileen in 1885, who died when she was seven years old, and a son named for Edward in 1893, who went by the nickname Ned. Edward and Carrie divorced in 1899, and Carrie committed suicide when Ned was just seven. Ned was raised by his father's second wife, who was also named Carrie. He married Lucy Smith of Pasadena in 1913, and his father gave the couple a lavish gift, a premium parcel of land consisting of 12.58 acres high up on a hill, offering citywide views. Ned and Lucy would have five children together. Right after they married, Ned attended USC for three years, earning a degree in business. He later would be elected to the Board of Trustees for the university. When World War I broke out, Ned joined the Navy and served as a lieutenant. When the war ended, he joined the Doheny Oil business as company vice president. It was while serving in that position that he became embroiled in the Teapot Dome scandal. Ned may or may not have known that when he was asked by his father to deliver $100,000 to U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, that he was bringing the man a bribe. The bribe was to help the Doheny Oil Company to gain leases on government-owned oil reserves. Doheny Sr. would later be acquitted, but Secretary Fall was found guilty of taking the bribes and imprisoned. It's believed that Doheny was successful in arguing that the money had been a loan that wasn't paid back. Ned himself wasn't found guilty of anything. Ned's wealth had grown, and he decided to build a mansion on the land that his father had given him. Construction began February 15, 1927, and even though it would take three years for the estate to be completed, the family moved into the manor in September 1928. The mansion was designed by Southern Californian architect Gordon B. Kaufman in the Tudor Revival style and was constructed by the P.J. Walker Company. Steel reinforced concrete made up the bulk of the home, with Indiana limestone decorating the outside. Welsh slate covers the roof. The interior of Greystone is breathtaking. The wood was hand-carved from oak. The floors were covered in black and white inlaid marble. The seven chimneys were handcrafted by seven individual artists. The kitchen had a pantry that was built to secure a large adjoining wall safe, and the living room opened onto a large balcony. The Dohenies would open the house up to guests on special occasions and have an orchestra playing out on that balcony. There were 55 rooms within the 46,054 square feet of living space. Servant rooms were on two floors of the east wing, 
and the family employed around 15 people. A circular staircase led into a recreation wing that spared no expense. There was a movie theater room, an original Brunswick bowling alley, billiard room, and a hidden bar. The construction costs for the entire property came to $3,166,578.12, which is around $46 million in today's money. This included the lavish grounds that were designed by landscape architect Paul G. Thien, who used a potpourri of Gothic and neoclassic architectural styles in his design. This design included a lake, brooks, cascading waterfalls, a greenhouse, swimming pool and pavilion, tennis courts, stables, kennels, gatehouse, and a fire station. The mansion became known as Greystone since it was made from stone that had a gray appearance, but in its time it was also known as Hearst Castle. But Ned wouldn't live long enough to see everything finished. He would die from a gunshot wound on the evening of February 16, 1929. The Doheny's had only lived in the partially finished mansion for five months when the 35-year-old Ned was found dead in a guest bedroom. His friend, Hugh Plunkett, was dead just outside the door of that bedroom. It is thought that the two men were having a disagreement that was described as a, quote, spirited conversation over the Teapot Dome scandal. When Ned had delivered the money to Secretary Fall, Hugh Plunkett had been with him. The trial was underway and Hugh was very worried that he would be left as the Fall guy. On this evening, it is believed that Hugh went to the gunroom and grabbed himself a weapon before going to talk to Ned. That weapon was a Colt Bisley single-action revolver. That single-action description is key in that it means that it takes less trigger pull to fire a bullet. That fact leads some people to believe that this was a tragic accident that then led to suicide. Hugh could have pointed the gun at Ned as he threatened him and perhaps asked for assurances that he wasn't going to be hung out to dry. He was nervous and angry and may have accidentally pulled slightly on the trigger, which was enough to fire the weapon. The bullet struck Ned in the head. A shaken hue then turned the gun on himself after realizing what he had done and killed himself in the hallway outside of the guest bedroom as Mrs. Doheny and a doctor approached. The case was closed within 48 hours and found to be a murder-suicide. But there's still a mystery as to what the men were fighting over. Some claim that Hugh wanted a raise. Perhaps he was asking for hush money. And then there's the theory that Ned was the gunman. The Doheny family plot is in a Catholic cemetery. Ned wasn't buried in the family plot, but rather at a totally different cemetery, Forest Lawn in Glendale, all alone. Why? Was it because he was a murderer rather than the victim and had then killed himself? Catholics don't approve of suicide, and that may have prevented his burial in the Catholic cemetery. That also explains how the gun came to be in the presence of this room. It seems rather weird to me that Hugh Plunkett would show up at the house and immediately go to the gun room and grab himself a weapon. Did he have access to the house that he could just walk in at any time and go wherever he wanted? Did he sneak into the house and then grab a gun? Seems like the house would have been a little bit more secure. If Hugh was coming over, you would think that he would have been greeted at the door and then led in to where Ned was by one of the servants or something else. Irregardless of what happened here, to close this case within 48 hours seems crazy. Is because of the money and the power of the Doheny family. They wanted to keep it hush-hush. Didn't want anybody to really realize what had happened here. There doesn't seem to be a lot of information about the head wounds. Did Hugh's wound appear to be a suicide with a barrel of the gun right against his head? And most importantly, what was Ned's head wound like? That would explain a lot here. Did it come from across the room at some distance? Or did it appear that he had shot himself in the head? We'll never know. Lucy continued living at Greystone until 1955. She had remarried, and she and her second husband, Lee M. Batson, sold most of the original land of the Paul Truesdale Corporation 
and they would develop Beverly Hills' prestigious Truesdale Estates homes. The mansion and the land that was left was sold to Henry Crown of Chicago-based Park Gray Corporation. Mr. Crown never moved into the house and leased it out as a popular filming location. The city of Beverly Hills purchased the property from Mr. Crown in 1965 for approximately $1.3 million, and they installed a water tank that serves as the city of Beverly Hills' largest reservoir. Throughout the years, the house has had various staff and visitors, and many of those people claim that the mansion is incredibly haunted, more than likely because of the mysterious death of Ned Doheny. But there were other tragedies here as well. A woman's servant killed herself inside the mansion's meat locker on the second floor of the servant's wing near the kitchen. She apparently had slid her wrists in that locker so that her blood would go directly down the built-in drain. She apparently didn't want her fellow workers to have to clean up the mess. A second servant was said to have been impregnated out of wedlock by someone who lived on the property during these years when it would have been very shameful to have a child out of wedlock. Being shunned by society, not to mention the fact that this was a very Catholic household in which she worked, she hanged herself in a room in the servant's wing. There was a love triangle between Doheny Mansion employees. There was a family driver, another male staff person, and a female staff person, which resulted in the woman's murder by strangulation. The police report states that she was wrapped in a carpet and removed from the mansion through the servant's wing door. A young girl, who was a friend of the Doheny daughter, Lucy, fell to her death from Lucy's second floor window onto the terrace. But there are some who believe that this was not an accident. A distraught man committed suicide on the property in 2003 by shooting himself in the head. His body was found still seated in place on a bench near the Willow Pond just minutes after he ended his life. Cleet Keith was hired by the city of Beverly Hills in the 1990s to help with community events, and in 2003 that role expanded to supervising the Greystone Mansion whenever it was being used for filming and photography. His office was in the gatehouse, and although he knew very little about the property's history or paranormal activity, he would get familiar with it very quickly and have dozens of his own experiences. He was so intrigued by it all that he started collecting the stories of the unexplained activity and put it together in the 2020 book, Ghosts of Greystone Beverly Hills, Dramatic Eyewitness Accounts. I'm going to share many of these accounts with you now from that work and encourage you to pick up the large tome, and I mean it is big, because what I present here is but a small sampling. The grand entry is really something to see. Many motion pictures and television shows have been filmed in this iconic entryway. These include Spider-Man, Spider-Man 3, The Social Network, The Disorderly Orderly, National Treasure Book of Secrets, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, Rockstar, All of Me, The Golden Child, The Gilmore Girls, and Ghostbusters 2. This is one of the most active areas in the mansion. Gabriel Jara's story is enough to give anyone chills. Ranger Gabe is quite reserved. In fact, when considering which rangers to approach regarding the mansion's paranormal activity, Gabe was not high on the list. He's that reserved. He never mentioned anything about spirits or the paranormal, and his daily patrols of Greystone Park didn't allow him much time inside the mansion. Gabe said this was after an event around one in the morning. As we shut everything down, Steve Clark realizes he forgot his lunchbox in the house, and this is one of his co-workers and a fellow ranger. He goes back inside with his flashlight, and I wait for him at the front entrance. It's pretty dark, and it seems like he's taking a lot of time. Gazing around, I look up to the second floor landing, and I suddenly see this white, I don't know, ghost figure. He's not wearing clothes. It is just a completely solid white figure. It looks like a man wearing a hat, a big hat, also white. I recall that very well. And all I can see is from the waist up. I can't see his legs. Maybe he has them. Maybe he doesn't. I'm not sure. And he's looking directly at me. So right away I look down because I'm like, what did I just see? Did I really see a ghost or an evil spirit? I look up again because this can't be real. And it was still there looking right at me. 
straight at me. And that just scared the living hell out of me. And that's when Steve shows up from inside the house. He was tired and couldn't wait to leave. He alarms the house and we get out. I wanted to say something, but I didn't. I thought, maybe I'm just seeing things, you know? I'm dead tired. It's my imagination. Maybe I should have looked back, but I was way too scared. I've never told that story to anybody. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. A park ranger supervisor named Juan Andrade tells this story. It was early in the morning, maybe a quarter to seven. I open the Richie Rich gates and the front door as I walk inside. I hear what sounds like a group of people whispering. I can't figure out what is going on. Then I hear one of the voices clearly say, he's in the house. I stop and listen and I'm thinking, who's in the mansion? But I don't hear the voices anymore. I flip on the lights and disarm the security system. I walk back to the main door and wait, but I hear nothing. Like I said, when I first walked in, it sounded like a group of people were whispering very, very low. I never heard footsteps moving away. Nothing. And I'm just standing there waiting for something to happen. It's completely quiet. I want to see if I hear anything else. There was nothing. But boy, it gave me chills. And when he says those Richie Rich gates, it's actually from the movie Richie Rich. They have the initial R on each ornamental metal gate. These were installed in 1994 for that film. They separate the West Courtyard from the Inner Courtyard. Chon Hang was also a lead park ranger, and he had an experience that has haunted him for years. For any of us who've been touched by a spirit, we could probably understand. He said, normally working the play is always the same for me. When it's over, I make one last round to make sure no one's in the mansion. I arm the alarm panel, turn the sconces off, and I'm gone. Simple. But this night was different. When I go to leave, I twist the doorknob to the left, which is normal, but the door won't open. Then, with more force, I turn it and push again. I can't get the door to budge. At that moment, to my left side, like from the top of my head, I feel someone run their fingers lightly down to my ear and then off my shoulder. I still can't get the door open. I just freaked out. Suddenly, the door opens up like I was now being allowed to exit. I quickly step out and close the door behind me. I grab my flashlight and shine it through that wrought iron and glass door. I see nothing. I try to calm myself down. I open the door, stick my flashlight inside, and shine it toward the stairwell to make sure no physical being is there. Then I realize the alarm. I have to disarm it before it goes off. Deep breath, and I go inside towards the alarm panel. I'm still facing the stairwell. I shine my flashlight everywhere just to make sure. Nothing. I disarm the panel. It's totally quiet. I scan the second floor stairs down to the bottom with the light. Nothing. I'm still freaked out trying to figure out what touched me. The alarm pad says it's ready to arm again. I arm the mansion, still facing the stairs. It's totally silent as I move away slowly over to the front door. Now my back is to the door. I reach behind me, turn the doorknob, and slowly walk out backwards, closing the door. I never heard a voice. I never saw anything. Just felt fingers down my head and off my shoulders. The mansion is now armed, and I slowly backed away. Here is another story from Juan. And this story starts near the grand entry and then leads up to the second floor landing. He says, I was on the job, and I walk inside the mansion, and I end up right by the main stairs outside of the men's bathroom. There's no one in the grand hallway. All the guests are inside in the rooms on their tours, and I'm keeping an eye on the main entrance door. I turn around to my right and look at the men's bathroom door. At first, I think I'm seeing a laser pointer because it was bright ruby red. It looked like someone was making a U pattern with the laser and then it disappeared. I quickly scan the area for anyone with a laser pointer, but there's nothing. At the same time, I hear Daniel and Sarah, this is the park ranger supervisor and venue coordinator, on the second floor, but I know Daniel doesn't carry a laser and he wouldn't point a laser down there anyway. Nobody else is in the grand hall, so I'm puzzled. I look back to the area where I clearly saw this red dot type laser light that had like a tail moving with it, but I still can't find the source. But I clearly saw it. It wasn't in my peripheral vision. It wasn't like a fast thing. No, I saw it. It moved in a circular motion and then it disappeared. It just stopped. I walk up two or three steps on the grand entry stairway and I hear Daniel walk away from the second floor landing and Sarah comes down the stairs and says, Hey, Daniel was looking for you. He wanted to tell you that he was leaving. I'm heading out too but I'm still puzzled where that red light came from. I walk up to the top of the grand entry stairs, 
take out my cell phone, and take a picture of the men's bathroom door. And what my cell phone camera does is throw a series of flashes before it takes a picture. So as I'm taking the picture, I can see an orb coming towards me, but my cell phone camera in the process of flashing is too slow to pick it up. But I clearly see an orb coming right at me on my phone's screen. It's white, a translucent white. Now I feel like someone is on the second floor moving around, but I don't see anything. Sarah's already grabbed her stuff and left along with Daniel, so there's no one up there. But then what I see is moving skin. You know how the banisters have carved designs and there are crevices like open areas? I could see what looks like a skin tone moving through the banister. Dark skin. Not black, but maybe my tone. But the vibe is there. I mean, I really feel it. Now all my hair is standing straight up. Someone or something has showed themselves to me and they're on the second floor landing. And suddenly I start to become very emotional. I want to cry. I feel as if I'm watching something I shouldn't see. Someone who's dead. It's just pure grief or sadness. It's the only way I can interpret it. I come down the stairs and that emotion goes away. But I know there's something still up on that second floor landing. And by now the guests are starting to leave the mansion. So I begin closing up the second floor landing, turning off the two chandeliers. And again, maybe 15 minutes later, I clearly feel something up there. The vibe came back very, very strong. There's so much energy that it bothers me. It is very uncomfortable. I feel that it's hurting me. It's almost like being in a science museum and you touch that ball that's sparking like lightning and all your hair stand up. I've never been hit by lightning, but can you imagine just an electrical field so powerful that it makes all your hairs on your body stand up and you can actually feel it on your skin? It's like that. It feels like a very strong electromagnetic field. So I turn off the lights and as I come back down the stairs, that energy is gone. It was almost as if a portal opened and I was going in and out of that electromagnetic field. It was almost as if a portal opened and I was going in and out of that electromagnetic field. I could feel it. I could literally feel the portal. I've never felt anything like this. And it was just so much all at once. I mean, first I see the chandelier phase in and out. Then I see the red orb. I also see someone or flesh moving on the second floor landing. And then all that electrical energy that is up there. My main concern was that I had a spirit attachment and was going to bring something with me. And then as soon as I leave the property, there's this burning sensation around my eye. Like I'd burn my eye around here, all around my left eye. As I'm driving home, it slowly went away. But it was the weirdest shit. Now, most people would scoff at this kind of a thing or this kind of description. But if you've ever been touched by a spirit, like I have... What he describes is exactly how it feels. I always tell people it's kind of like those electric balls when you touch them and you can feel like your hair sticking up on end and you feel this weird energy moving around you or down your neck or down your arm, which is what I felt. So to me, it does clearly seem that he was being touched by something. And clearly when these kinds of entities are around, they are giving off some kind of an electromagnetic field which is why we're able to use equipment to pick up on them, because we're picking up on that particular field. This grand entry sounds like a crazy place. I'd love to go there just to take pictures, and uh, possibly you could catch something other than just the wonderful carved woodwork and the marble flooring that's there. Right off the grand staircase, of course, is the Grand Hall. This has been in the films Rockstar, National Treasure, Book of Secrets, The Muppets, Mercury Rising, Hanging Up, the Big Lebowski, Dead Ringer, Death Becomes Her, There Will Be Blood, The Astronaut's Wife, and Star Trek Into Darkness. This is where disembodied Ned is believed to have struck. And this happened to retired park ranger Luz Rodriguez. She said, I'm outside cleaning the windows on the terrace and I look up and there's someone standing inside the mansion. At first I think it's someone at the grand entry door or maybe it's a reflection of someone standing behind me. But when I look back, there's no one there. I saw who I believe to be Ned Doheny standing right here in the middle of the grand hallway. But I couldn't see his shoes. He was cut off somehow. Like you couldn't see his whole body, definitely not most of his legs. He was almost floating and kind of see-through transparent. He was wearing a reddish smoking jacket. He had a mustache. His hair was neatly combed. And he just stood there looking at me for a long time. I still get the chills. And I was just like, Okay, hi Ned, this is weird. And then I thought, my mind is playing tricks, you know? It can't be. But it was like he was fully materialized. 
Now, the interesting thing about this story is that, of course, Luz clearly seems to know what Ned Doheny looks like, but she probably didn't know this information. Cleet showed her the murder-suicide photo of Ned Doheny, and she just stared at it, shocked. Because in that photo, you can see Ned, deceased, lying on the floor, bloodied in what looks like a smoking jacket. Now, unfortunately, the pictures are in black and white, so they will never know if it was red, but it was definitely a dark-colored jacket. Les says that definitely gave her goosebumps. Cleet has his own story about an apparition. He had accompanied a television crew on a walkthrough of the mansion so that they could plan an upcoming shoot. As he watched the crew, he noticed a woman looking over at him. She appeared unnerved. Cleet said, I knew right away that something had taken place and she was anxious. She broke away from the rest of the crew and approached me. In a hushed tone, her first question was, is this place you know? And I said, no, I don't know. I knew what she was talking about, but I always prefer to let people tell their story first before I volunteer my information involving spirit activity. She lowered the sound of her voice even more and said, I mean, are there ghosts in here? I still wouldn't divulge any information. Why do you ask? And she said, ever since I was a little girl, I was able to see and hear even sense ghosts around me. But when I turned 15, she was in her 30s at this time, it got too much for me to handle, so I shut it down. I couldn't take it anymore. But when I walked into this house and I was standing here with the crew, this little girl ran up to me and said, my name is Emily. It's Emily. My name is Emily. It became obvious to this woman that the rest of the crew could not see or hear the little girl. She realized it was happening again, just as it had when she was a young girl. She told me she casually broke away from the group, stepped behind a wall where she couldn't be seen, turned to the little girl and said, okay, your name is Emily. Okay, I got that. But you've got to stay away from me. Please don't do this to me. Stay away. She backed away from the little girl, shaken by what had just taken place and walked back to the crew. Then she asked me point blank, is this place haunted? I said, yes. The questions kept coming. Did a little girl die here? I said, yes. She asked, was her name Emily? I said, we don't know. She took a long pause, looked me dead in the eyes and said, it's Emily. From that day on, I've called the spirit Emily. Whenever I walk into the mansion, I say, hi, Emily, it's Cleet. If I'm there at night, I say, Emily, you can come out and talk to me if you want. I've never seen her, but that woman finally gave a name to the spirit. And according to my research, she has been seen at least five times. Martin Perez worked for the janitorial services. And he says this happened in the Grand Hall. I was passing through and suddenly, bang. I honestly thought someone fired a shot in the house. I stopped dead. It had that echo sound a gunshot would have bouncing off the walls. And it was so loud. Really loud. I couldn't tell if it was coming from upstairs or the bottom floor. Like I said, it echoes. But no one was in the house. It's weird because they have the play and they perform it on the staircase. And they have the guy shooting with that snap bang sound from the gunshot. I honestly felt that I heard the same thing by the staircase. Snap, bang, it really scared me. Cleet himself said, I've captured several remarkable recordings of what appears to be exactly what Martin heard, a loud gunshot ringing out. Martin also had this experience. I was outside the card room looking in from the terrace to the grand hall. With the reflection of the light outside, it's kind of hard to see in, so you have to cup your hands to get a better look. It was early in the morning. The piano tuner was scheduled, and I see him at the front door with Steve Clark, who was the park ranger supervisor. Then I see this tall man, all dressed in white, with his head down and his hands in his pockets, walking through the grand hall. He was a tall, white male. As Steve and the piano tuner walked down the main entrance staircase, this man in white walked right past Steve and up the staircase toward the entrance. Obviously, Steve and the piano tuner didn't see him. So I went around to the front door, and the man in white was no longer there. I waved at Steve and rushed over to catch him before he left the mansion. And I said, hey, Steve, who's the other guy? And he's like, what other guy? The piano tuner? I said, no, this guy was all dressed in white and he was very tall. You didn't see him? Steve said, no, I felt something, but I didn't see anything. But I did. He just walked right past Steve. I couldn't tell if he went upstairs or just faded away. But I clearly saw him. He was a solid figure, Caucasian, really pale. It kind of tripped me out. I was like, whoa. No way it was a reflection from the outside because I was looking with my hands cupped against the window and my head was literally right up against the glass. So there's no possible way. Just makes you think like maybe this is the thing that's following me around because it's always here on the first floor. So who knows? Another mystery in the mansion. This is a really chilling story. 
Lisa Turner had been the creative director of Interior Obsession, and she was called in to do some design work for the card room and terrace. Frank Turner is her husband, and he was there with her. He said, I'm in the card room that Lisa's designing, and I just returned from touring the home. I'm standing off to the side watching Lisa interacting with some guests, and I feel this cool breeze go past me, and I get so cold, and I say to myself, what is that? What's going on? And then I got colder and colder to the point where I start shaking, freezing. And I was going to go tell Lisa, but I'm shaking so much that I didn't want to approach her. I mean, my teeth were chattering. I was so cold. I mean, this feels like a serious medical thing. I have to leave. All I could think about was getting in my car and turning on the heat. And that's what I did. I got in my car and I turned the heat up as high as I could. And I remember driving down Highland near sunset and I'm still shaking and I still can't get warm. So now I go to Kaiser Hospital and I tell them, I'm just shaking. I'm so cold. I don't know what's going on. So I'm in the ER and they start checking my vitals and the doctor says, your oxygen is fine. You don't have a fever, but yeah, your hands and extremities are really cold. You could be coming down with something. Take a couple aspirin, go home and get warm. So I got in a hot tub of water and that's the only thing that worked. After about an hour, I kind of came back to normal. Overall, it lasted about five hours. I've never been that cold in my life. I wasn't sick. I didn't have the flu, but the doctors couldn't explain it. And then a few days later, I went back to the mansion. We were taking things down in the room, and Steve Clark was there sharing a little bit about the history of the mansion and the suicides that had occurred, and I said, something strange happened to me a few days ago, and that's when it all came out. It was all very bizarre. Of course, the most important room to this story is the murder room, and that's what they call it to this day. Luz, who's that retired park ranger, tells this story about the murder room. The bathroom faucet turned on by itself. I'm not kidding. When you're on the job in the mansion for a long time, it gets a little boring. It gets a lot boring. So I'd wander through the house and I'd look carefully through the rooms, the woodwork, the designs, even the bathrooms. I'd look at the detail of the tile work. So in this bathroom, as we walk inside the murder room bathroom, I'm looking at the bathroom scale. I have my back to the faucet and then I hear the water come on. And I was like, why is the water coming on? The water wasn't just leaking. It was really running. So I turn it off and walk out and I hear it come on again. And so I said out loud, like I'm talking to myself, okay, guys, you can't play with the water because I'm leaving. We can't leave the water running. So I'm going to turn it off, leave it off. So I turned it off again. And as I'm leaving, I'm hoping it doesn't happen again. It didn't. I guess they listened to me. A visitor to the house was named Tim. He said, I'd never heard of Greystone before. I was on vacation with my partner for the Christmas holidays, and we met with some friends in Los Angeles. And that morning it was suggested we tour Greystone Mansion. I was open-minded about ghosts when I was much younger, but as I've aged, I'm 44 now, I've become more cynical. My view recently has been, well, I didn't exist before I was born, so why should I exist after I die? I've never had a ghost experience before, although I've been in houses before that have felt spooky. The tour started around 5.30 p.m. Our guide, John, started to explain that the house had quite a history. We were in the murder room on the ground floor, and John was telling us the story of how the owner, Ned, and his friend, Hugh, had been found shot dead in an apparent murder-suicide. However, lots of mystery and theories have surrounded this. One theory was that Ned and Hugh were lovers. I stood in the middle of the room with my back to the doorway that leads into the main hallway and said out loud, well, it was clearly Lucy, Ned's wife, that killed them. I bet she walked in on them. It's worth noting at this point that I wasn't in a spooky frame of mind. I was merely just fascinated by the history of the house. Within seconds, I heard a voice that came from the direction of the doorway behind me. Everyone on the tour, there were six of us in total, including John, were all in front of me. I recall it was a light female voice. It sounded like a young lady. And I'd say it actually sounded English, maybe a little posh. It's annoyed me ever since that I didn't catch what she actually said, but I know it was three short words. And all three words were one syllable. Initially, I was just really surprised and taken aback. I quickly looked in the direction of the voice, but no one was there. And I already knew we were the only people in the house at this time. I quickly nudged my partner who was standing next to me. Did you hear that? He hadn't. At this point, John turned and asked me what was wrong, as I think I must have looked rather shocked. It was only after I explained that I heard a voice that he said it was common at Greystone, but that he hadn't heard of that happening in the murder room. The rest of the tour, we kept talking about it. But I do think it's telling that this happened before I was aware that this place was haunted and before my mindset got spooked. But we all jumped to the conclusion it might have been Lucy. Maybe she was annoyed I had accused her. I don't know. Maybe she said, you are wrong. Or maybe she was saying, you are right. All I know for certain is I didn't imagine the voice. I'm not a firm believer, but after this, I think I'm more open-minded. 
Mary Nichols is a professional photographer, and she was an official photographer at one of the many design showcases that was hosted at the Greystone Mansion. She said, the first time I shot in the mansion, I didn't think I'd be willing to come back. I simply wasn't prepared for just how creepy and haunted this place is. I get through the two weeks of the show, but then I think, I hope they don't ask me back again. I don't really want to come back here. And then a year or so passes and you kind of get yourself together feeling like you can come back and deal with the haunted factor. But I remember telling Ranger Steve Clark one night, we're just tired and it's late and the electricity is kind of going in and out. I think we're just going to make this our last shot. And he goes, well, there are ghosts here. And I said, Steve, the only thing I noticed here is I think there might be a dead animal under the entry to that room where Doheny was killed. There was a strong kind of rotting smell there while I was shooting. And he said, well, that's right where one of the bodies was. In a few days after we all got to know each other, he let me read the first paranormal investigation report and it mentioned that exact smell and location. We're back to Martin from the janitorial services, and he was in the mansion with the park ranger, John Hang, one time, and they had a shared experience. There was a time with me and Ranger Hang in which we are both talking in the center of the Grand Hall, and I was like, hey, Hang, don't leave me here with these damn ghosts. You know, we're messing around joking. He goes, yeah, 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 I'm going to leave you here all alone. Then he told me, look, don't worry, we're calm. There's no events, so there's no one in the house. As soon as he said, there's no one in the house, the murder room door slammed shut. Boom. See, it still gives me the chills. As soon as Hang said that, I swear to God, we both stopped and stared at the murder room door. And Hang says, forget this, I'm gone. I was like, Hang, no, you can't leave. Don't leave me alone. But that door really spooked us. I swear, as soon as he said, there's no one in the house, wham, bam, the murder room door slammed shut. It hit so hard it echoed through the whole house. When he was asked what happened next, he said, nothing. Hang takes off. He just leaves me there on my own, and I'm just standing there like, ah, I guess I have to deal with it. I definitely don't get paid enough. Andrea worked for janitorial services, and she said, It was around Thanksgiving last year. There was a lot of light. Must have been midday. As I was mopping in the hallway at the west end of the Grand Hall, just outside the murder room door, I saw a stain. A wet stain on the floor. It looked like blood. So I mopped it up, but the water was clear when I put the mop in the bucket. It should have dirtied the water, right? And dirtied the mop. So Cleet asked her if she thought that there was actual blood on the floor. No, there was no blood, but that's what I saw. That's what I mopped up. But like I said, nothing in the water. But now, having seen the murder photo of Hugh for the first time, he's laying in the same spot where I thought I mopped up the blood. I didn't know that he was killed outside the room. I thought that everything happened inside the room, that they were both killed inside. We always had that impression. There was no way for me to know that that was the same spot. Your photo amazed me. I feel goosebumps because I didn't expect that. I mean, how could I see something that I didn't know anything about? How could I see it so clear? And I only told Vilma what happened to me, nobody else. But I'm glad I did because maybe the photo confirms what I saw. Maybe the spirits wanted to tell me about what happened that night. Someone wants me to know what happened. That's what I feel those two guys, Ned and Hugh, are trying to tell me. This book goes on for nearly 500 pages. There are a ton of experiences at this mansion. Definitely a place that I would want to check out someday. We will probably never know exactly what happened between Ned Doheny and his personal secretary and friend, Hugh Plunkett. And that is perhaps why spirits linger here at the Greystone Mansion. Is the mansion haunted? That is for you to decide. Thanks so much for listening to History Ghost Bumps, Phantasmal Crime. If you'd like to share with us a haunted crime that you've heard about, please write us at historyghostbump at gmail.com. I've been your host, Diane. Join me on the next episode for another trip through the shadows. This has been a production of History Ghost Bump Podcast.